How's it going guys? Balder here, and I am currently in the Cessna 172 with the beautiful mechanical gauges. So, as you guys know, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is just around the corner, coming out in August, and a lot of people are going to be getting into this game. A lot of people who are new to flight simulators, a lot of people who are new to aviation, and it's actually a really exciting time to be in the flight sim community. So, the big issue, however, is that there are going to be people who have no idea what to do when it comes to flying. So, this is what this video is about. So, the Cessna 172 is very basic. So, we have a single-engine propeller plane, piston-driven, carbureted, nothing fancy, but... It is a very basic airplane, very easy to learn. There are some things that are a little bit complicated about it, but I'm going to go through it. So, first things first, let's talk about the gauges. What is everything that you see here? Well, first things first, this is the airspeed indicator, or the speedometer if you want to be colloquial about it. The basic thing you need to know about the airspeed indicator is that you have this thing called the pitot tube right here, and this pitot tube will measure the pressure that's being jammed into that tube, and that would give you an airspeed reading. This is the attitude indicator, also known as the artificial horizon. So the attitude indicator tells you the orientation in relation to the Earth itself, and it uses gyros to make sure that things stay, you know, or oriented. This is our altimeter. Pretty basic. It tells you how high that you're going to be. This is your nav aid. Uh, technically VOR if you want to get into it. But basically, if you want to go somewhere, you want to make sure that these needles are square and it tells you that you're heading in the right direction. Alright, so over here we have the fuel gauge, exhaust gas temperature, the fuel flow should always be in the green. This is the turning coordinator, and this here is a level. So, in other words, if the level is here, then that means that the, well, that the airplane is kind of going this way, if that makes any sense. Or basically, that's where things are going. So, you want to make sure that this is always in the center. It's kind of hard for me to explain. But you correct this mainly with a rudder. This tells you which orientation you are turning. So if it banks to the left, your plane's going to the left. Banks to the right, going to the right. Simple as that. This right here is our heading indicator. The heading indicator is not a compass. It would be this. But what you need to make sure of is that the heading indicator is roughly aligned with a compass. And as it stands right now, it is. This is the vertical speed indicator. The vertical speed indicator tells you how quickly you are climbing or descending. Alright, so, with that said, you have temperature gauges. They should always be in the green. You never want them in the red. Vacuum, basically this is talking about uh, the fuel pump. Or not exactly a fuel pump, but uh, how much fuel is getting siphoned from the tanks. The tanks are in the wings, so in a Cessna, where the wings are above the engine, that isn't too much of an issue. Amps basically tells you how much power is going through here. You always want it to be at least in the positive. If it is in the negative, that means you are losing power. Below that, you have a bunch of circuit breakers. It's not anim animated in X-Plane, but... Yeah, these are all uh, circuit breakers and fuses and whatnot. This is our RPM monitor and our tachometer. You generally want it to be in the green. This means that you're going overboard. However, going below the green isn't too bad. It's just that when you get to get under 1,000 RPMs, then it starts to get a little bit iffy. This is our navigation aids, this is our autopilot, we have our comms panel, this is our transponder. These are our magnetos, pretty much like a car switch. This is our battery, well, battery here, altimeter here, or not 
altimeter alternator. Holy crap. Yeah. So you want this uh, to always be on when you're flying. I mean, no brainer there. Fuel pump, if you need to pump fuel from the engines. These are the lights. You always want the beacon light on whenever the engines are on or whenever this plane is moving a distance. Landing lights are for takeoff and landing. Taxi is for nighttime on the taxiway. Nav lights give you the orientation. They are required at night. Strobe is required during flight. Then you have the pitot heat, which will provide heat in case this pitot tube freezes up. The avionics controls all the systems. This is your trim wheel. These are internal lights. This is a fuel selector, and this is something that you can use to talk to air traffic control or over the PA. So you could just look behind your shoulder and say, hey kids, shut up or I'm turning this around. And then, last but not least, you have cabin, um, you have cabin heat. These, this is heater stuff, which isn't animated. You have an emergency fuel shutoff. You have the throttle, and you have the fuel mixture. The fuel mixture, simply put, um, provides fuel to the engines. If it's completely all the way back, you are starving the engines of any type of, well, any type of fuel. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and get this thing started. So the first thing that you'll want to do is that the mixture should be fully rich. This would be rich. This would be lean. You want it at full rich and start up. These are the flaps, by the way. And then once that happens, you want to turn on your battery and your alternator. Fuel pump needs to go on. Beacon needs to go on. The magnetos need to turn on. So right and left, and then eventually both. At this point, if this were real life, you would yell clear out the window. And then you would open the throttle about um, an eighth of an inch. With that said, you start it up like a car. And it says that the gyro is not aligned with magnetic north. Well, thank you for the information. But generally, after startup, you're going to want to align that if the simulator hasn't done that already. So, moving on. You always want to make sure that the RPMs are at least above a thousand because going any lower you could pretty much cut off um, too much fuel to the engines. But once this is done you turn on the avionics. Both buses need to be turned on and things look good. 1200 is what you will have when it comes to any type of transponder code outside of controlled airspace. We are outside of controlled airspace for the most part. We're in Tooele Valley Airport and yeah, not that busy of an airport. If we were to go a little bit east to Salt Lake International, that would be a different story. Either way, here are a few things that we need to do afterwards. First off, the altimeter is never um, always set in stone. You actually need to change the barometric pressure. So the barometric pressure is going to be 3006. So that's 3001, oh, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, cool. Now we have that out of the way. Let's go ahead and turn our attention to the uh, heading indicator. So it's going to be one, two, three notches. Um, that's going to be three notches between north and 330, so we got to adjust it a little bit to here, uh, right there, there we go. Cool, now that, our, um, now that our instruments are set, we should check. Fuel indicator shows we have full tanks, fuel flow is good, exhaust gas temperature is cold, 
Things are in the green. Vacuum is not in the green. However, we do have a fuel pump, so that's not exactly an issue. Amps are not showing in the negative, so we are good with that. It means our alternator is working. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, what we're going to do is that we are going to start taxing. What you want to do is that you want to add a little bit of throttle to get things going, and then once things are going, you can ease it back a little bit. So, a few things about the Cessna. The taxi controls aren't the best. You're most likely going to be using a lot of differential braking, which kind of brings me to the point of, okay, what should we do? Um, what kind of joystick should we get? You should get a joystick with at least a twist control, which allows you to control the rudder. So right now, I'm taking a look. So the wind is going to be coming at us from uh, 190. So that will be um, coming from the south, which means we will uh, be taking off from the north. Heading southbound, so we will go uh, that way accordingly. Mind you, I'm going off of real world weather, off of the official uh, METAR. Aviationweather.gov is what you want to do in order to get your uh, information, and I will provide a link in the description if I remember. Cool, so now that we're taxiing, a few things I want to uh, bring up. Notice that the turn coordinator goes with turning, but when you turn, the uh, ball is going to go the opposite direction. That shows that things are good. Seeing that the airspeed indicator is not active is perfectly normal. That's because there isn't enough air pressure to give you any type of reading. Now you generally, while taxiing, want to apply brakes every so often. You don't want to ride the brakes, but you want to brake every so often in order to make sure that you have a uh, good airspeed. Also notice to the right we have a windsock. You always want to take off into the wind unless you have a specific airport where there's only uh, one way to uh, take off and land. All right, so uh, we'll keep going. This is not the entirety of the length of a runway, and honestly, this is a pretty big runway for uh, such a small airport, and the reason being is because of a high altitude. High altitude flying, uh, well, there are many definitions. What I mean by high altitude is high elevation. Taking off at a high elevation requires a little bit of extra thought going into it, particularly with the mixture of your uh, fuel settings, along with uh, different speeds, different rates of climb, stuff like that. This isn't something you need to know off the bat, but there are charts available for you to look at in such situations, and let me break a little bit. Cool. Now one thing I do want to point out is that there is always a run-up before you take off. I'm going to go through a pseudo run-up for you, not by the book, but it will give you an idea of uh, what we do when we uh, run the plane up. Normally it would be over that way, out of the way of other airplanes, but seeing that there's no traffic, we're just going to go all the way to the whole short line. Okay. So here we are, brakes are set. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna uh, increase 
the throttle a little bit. To not much, just 1800 RPMs. All right, cool. So the first thing that we're going to do is that we are going to pull back the mixture. You'll notice that the uh, that the RPMs are climbing. This is because of a thing called the stoichiometric ratio. More fuel doesn't necessarily mean more performance. There needs to be a perfect balance between that and oxygen. So you keep going until you start to see a drop off. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. There's a drop off, back to full. And then to prevent the engine from overheating, you're gonna bring it in just a little bit. Cool. Now, we are gonna test the magnetos. So we'll go to left. You'll see a uh, drop in performance. You go back to both. Then we test the right. We see a drop, back to both. If it drops too much on one of them, that means that one of your magnetos has failed and you'd have to uh, cancel the takeoff. And then the last thing that we're going to do is that we are going to pull the throttle all the way back, see if the engine still runs. You don't want to leave it there for too long. You want to bring it back. There we go. Alright, so now that we got this out of the way, got a little darker somehow, doesn't matter too much. Now we got this out of the way, we are going to uh, prep things for takeoff. So what we're going to do is that we're going to turn the landing lights on, we're going to turn the strobe on, and then we are going to push the transponder to out, or altitude. There we go. Now a lot of this stuff is not mandatory to uh, get a plane up in the air, but this is more or less the proper procedure. You'd also check to see that there's no oncoming traffic. If I was in a radio frequency, I would say, you know, C um, Cessna 172 Sierra Papa taking off from a uh, 17 heading north or something like that. So you want to line up perfectly or as perfect as you can get. Go full throttle. And what you'll start to notice is that there's a lot of torque generated by the propeller. So what you'll have to do is that you'll have to put in right rudder in order to compensate for that. The airspeed will go alive and you want to rotate at 65 knots. So we're at 65 knots. We're going to rotate. There we go. Now there is no landing gear here. We are going to take off. We are going to get to altitude. I think 6,500 feet would be a good altitude for us to do maneuvers. It is worth pointing out that the perfect rate of climb, or not the perfect rate of climb, but the best rate of climb is going to be 70 knots. So try to reach that. Cool, so everything's good to go. The trim wheel, you want to make sure that you adjust to make sure that uh, you don't need to fight with the controls all the time. This will control your up and down motion. Always be mindful of your uh, orientation. Right now we are heading uh, currently south, but things are looking pretty good. Alright, so we just passed a thousand feet above ground level. This is important for several reasons, but mainly it has to do with emergency procedures. I should have brought this up before takeoff, but let me explain. In a Cessna, if there is a problem on the runway, you go at, for an immediate full stop. If there is a problem after takeoff, then you will find the uh, nearest field to land on. And that nearest field could be the remainder of the runway, if you have enough room. However, once you're past a thousand feet and a problem occurs, you will attempt to 
make it back to the runway. Alright, so with that said, we're going to be doing a uh, turning climb. You always want to climb about uh, 20 degrees. And you want to pull the nose up whenever you're turning, just for the sole fact that you um, will end up having your nose lowered because of the lack of lift that's going strictly upwards. You generally don't want to overshoot. I did overshoot a little bit. I was trying to aim for westward. But things are looking pretty good so far. If you overshoot uh, your turn, just uh, compensate a little bit and head back on track. In the meantime, uh, what we're going to be doing is that we are about to reach our altitude, 6,500 feet. And from here, uh, I'm going to explain a few things. Alright, so first things first, you want to uh, lower the throttle settings. Pull the throttle back a little bit once you get to straight and level flight. The reason being is that once you're no longer fighting against gravity and climbing, your airspeed is going to pick up incrementally and you don't need that extra power. It wastes fuel, causes a strain on the engine, and simply put, you don't need it. It's not going to make your plane that much faster. Alright, cool. Now that we got that out of the way, we're currently in straight level flights. We can do several maneuvers. One of the first things I'm going to do is that, well, I should probably turn away from the town. Just for the fact that I don't, um, in real life, you wouldn't want to uh, be above any populated area when you do this maneuver. And this maneuver in question is going to be a stall. Now, here's the thing. The stall is not going to be done immediately. What I'm first going to be doing is this thing called slow flight. So I'm going to be pulling things back. I'm going to be keeping my nose up so that I don't lose altitude. But once that goes down, I'm going to uh, raise my flaps five degrees or one notch, I should say. Cool, and now we're in what is called slow flight. You always want to make sure that your airspeed is above the green arc. Now one of the things you'll notice is that as you are going slower, you can turn a lot more quickly. You can turn on a dime almost. So you're going 25. Notice that the turn coordinator is going way further than it normally would if you've uh, been paying attention. Also, speaking of paying attention, you should always keep your nose up when you are uh, turning, especially in slow flight, and keep the speed up. All right, cool. But now that we're in this slow flight configuration, now is a good time to talk about stalling. Stalling is when you have no real airflow sticking to the top of the wing, which prevents any type of lift from occurring. When this happens, the plane will fall like a rock. So let's go ahead and get back to altitude, shall we? Um, the flaps are all the way extended, as you can tell. And now what I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to be cutting the power and I'm going to be trying to maintain that, this altitude. Alright, lost a little bit of altitude on that one. But yeah, so the way that you deal with a stall is to put your nose down and go full throttle.
There we go. So flaps are all the way back up. Going to be doing a clearing turn all the way to uh, 270 or west. As people prefer to call it. All right, cool. Now we're going to be talking about a power on stall. Power on stall is when you have the power out all the way and you still cause a stall. Now here's the thing. Um, I'm going to try to get into a uh, slight stall to get my speed down and then I'm going to add full throttle. So I keep pulling my nose up, pulling my nose up, pulling my nose up. Full throttle. Lift my nose up. Nose comes down. And then you recover. All right, so another thing I should mention is that when you are in a stall, you need to make sure that you're, you have the proper orientation because remember, this propeller has a lot of torque. It's gonna wanna make the plane turn left. So in order to compensate for that, you will have to um, apply right rudder and use your uh, and use your pitch, not your pitch, but your roll to maintain your orientation in uh, the said climb. Now with that said, we're gonna head back to the airport and uh, continue with what we we're gonna be doing, which is landing. So I'm gonna be lowering the altitude a little bit. The altitude should be 5,280, which I believe is the, yeah, which I believe is the altitude 1,000 feet above the airport. Also, mind you that while this isn't going to be much of an issue with uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, not every airplane is going to have a GPS. So keep that in mind. The other thing is to make sure that we are heading towards the airport. And we are going to be using our Eagle Vision because every flight simulator pilot has Eagle Vision to figure out where we need to go. Now this Eagle Vision is pretty much going to be in every flight simulator you ever play. Just for the sole fact that I don't know why. I think they just like the zoom settings. Could it be because of rendering? Uh, I'm not too entirely sure. Alright, so 1700 RPMs is generally the uh, power setting that we have while descending. This can be adjusted if needed. All right, there we go. So now we are at a uh, we are at a good airspeed. We are at a good altitude. Uh, need to uh, stop my rate of descent a little bit. Good RPMs. Okay. So what we're doing is called entering the traffic pattern. So you always want to approach the runway at a 45 degree angle to get into the traffic pattern. And this could change and complicate things if you go into Class B airspace, which is um, the busiest type of airspace you can get into. At that point, an air traffic controller will tell you what to do. But in this case, 
what we're going to be doing is that we're going to enter the traffic pattern via crossing, well, it's going to be interesting, but basically I'm going to be landing on this runway. And so what I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to be uh, doing some uh, turns to properly line up with the runway and these turns are also going to be known as legs. So we will be, we are currently on the intercept and once we uh, turn towards, the, towards these crop rotations, we are, are they called crop rotations? No, anyway. Historical pedantry aside, what we're going to be doing is that we are going to uh, be going through each leg. Right now we are in the upwind leg because we are traveling uh, upwind. Or against the wind, as I should say. And we're not planning on landing um, towards this end. But what we will be doing is that we will be using the runway as a reference as to where to go. So we will wait until we are at a 45 degree angle. Cool. We will turn and we will make a 90 degree turn. Now this 90 degree turn is going to be fairly uh, important because you want to make sure that you don't cut any corners. Now if this were real aviation then we would cut across midfield and intercept the uh, runway that way. Okay, there we go. Now generally you want to be half a mile away from the runway for each leg. So I'm going to uh, travel a little, little bit further from here. Make sure I uh, have my nose pulled up. And I'm going to travel uh, north-ish. Cool, so now we're on the downwind leg of the runway. We want to make sure that we gain our altitude, that we are a thousand feet above the runway. Also, now would be a good time to turn your fuel pump off. There we go. And we want to see the runway threshold, which is right here. Once we get past that runway threshold, we're going to pull the RPMs back to 17. We want to get the airspeed into this white arc so that we can deploy the flaps. It's in the white arc. Let's go ahead and deploy the flaps. Cool. Push the nose down because the flaps are going to increase lift. Wait until you are it's past your shoulder turn add another notch of flaps increase the rpm all right now we're on the base leg also known as turning base You can add or subtract as much power as you need. Generally, power is going to be a more deciding factor on your descent rate than the pitch of your plane. Once you turn final, you add your last notch of flaps. And then you will fly in. Now, if it were a particularly hot day, then you may want to forego the last notch of flaps. It should be a good 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not too entirely sure what they are in rest of the world units. But we'll be uh, turning in. So these three white, um, those four white dots indicates that we're high. So we're gonna th pull our throttle back until we get two reds, two whites. Then we'll add a little bit of power. There we go, we are now on the glide slope. We are at 
We're on final approach and we are about to land. Uh, gotta slow my rate of descent a little bit. Last thing you want is four red uh, dots. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right, so we're about to land. As you move past, you're going to want to uh, thro pull the throttle all the way back and flare up. All right, so a little bit rough of a landing. That's perfectly fine. Now, the thing about a Cessna is that it is pretty robust. But you can also do this thing called a touch and go. And then attempt it again. So what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, rotate at 65 knots. Make sure you add in your right rudder to keep things oriented. Climb with 70 to 75 knots. And then we'll repeat the process again. This time we will be doing a full stop landing. Oh wow, there was a bit of drift. It's no big deal. Also, be aware, you can always go around. If you feel like there is a landing that is too dangerous, feel free to go around, try again. Now, that may not be the deciding factor in a flight simulator, but that's what a pilot would realistically do. Alright, so when you are landing, just be aware that the pitch, the up and down of the plane, is going to control the airspeed, while the throttle is going to control the rate of descent. That is completely counterintuitive to what you might think, but that's how it works. Alright. Uh... We're a little bit high. Now we're past the threshold markers. Descending, lowering the uh, throttle to 1700. Mind you, every plane is going to behave differently, but this is how you would do it in a Cessna. Alright, so for this case, we're going to be uh, going for a, a long final approach. By the way, when you're heading towards the runway, that's when you have a final approach. That is when you're on final.
All right, added the final notch of flaps. Now the final notch of flaps is going to be important for the purpose of drag more than it is for the importance of lift. You really want to slow this plane down. All right, cool, so we're uh, two reds, two whites. We want to keep it that way and we'll just accordingly if we don't get to the proper glide slope. RPMs are a little bit high, but it's warranted to uh, maintain this glide slope, uh, probably because of the altitude of this airport. Mm. Yeah, in fact, we need to add a little bit more power. All right, so higher altitudes means uh, more power and more speed to do things, or it requires more power and more speed to get things accomplished. All right, so. Looks like we are pretty good on approach. All right, keep the nose up. And there we go. Have the throttle back to a thousand. Raise the flaps. There we go. So this is a full stop landing, which means that we need to uh, turn onto the next taxiway to get out of here. All right, there we go. Around this point, we would uh, bring up the fact that we are clear of the taxiway. Once we go past this uh, hold short line, then we'll announce we're clear. All right, so after landing, strobe goes off, landing goes off. Transponder goes on to standby. This may be different depending on what the airport requires. Let's go ahead and taxi back to our parking spot though. Don't ask me why the compass is freaking out. I think it's trying to emulate a rumble, but the uh, video card is failing miserably. Not too entirely sure. Alright, there we go. <clears throat> Alright, so this is not the uh, parking spot that we originated from that's a little bit further down. Alright, so things are looking pretty good. Now, if you're wondering why I'm able to uh, move my head around the cockpit um, so easily, it is because I use head tracking hardware known as Track IR. This is completely 100% optional for those of you who are wanting to get into uh, flight simming. But it does make things easier, especially with GA stuff. And if you want to do dogfighting and say War Thunder and stuff like that, you are much better off with that.
All right, so we're going to turn here. Make sure we don't hit anything, especially the $12 million private jet that's right there. Not sure why he keeps saying that, but uh, it doesn't matter too much. Jesus, that's close. But now I'm switching to external view because, whoa. Because mainly for stuff like that. Alright, cool. So, a few things we need to do before we uh, stop this flight, stop this plane, turn off the engine. Lower the RPM so that we don't uh, ruin the brakes. Avionics, they're going off. You always want to make sure that the avionics go off before you turn off the engine. That way there is no power surge that will kill it. Same thing for starting. You always want to turn on the engine before you turn on the avionics. Next thing we want to do, understood, is test the magnetos. We see the drop, we go back to both. Cool. Now the way that you turn the engine off is not, and I repeat, you do not pull this button. Instead, what you will do is that you will uh, pull the mixture all the way to lean. There we go. Once that's done, beacon's off, magneto's off, master's off. All right, cool. So this is a flight that uh, we just did. Hopefully this tutorial has been helpful and letting you understand what it's like to uh, fly an airplane, how to properly do it. I didn't do it exactly perfectly. I should have turned off the fuel pumps and uh, landing lights soon after takeoff. But otherwise, um, so far, smooth sailing. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. And as always, you have a good one.